Welcome back to this module on VLIW processes. In this and the next lesson, we will look at some challenges of VLIW processes and potential solutions to these challenges. In particular, in this lesson, I will discuss VLIW scheduling modules and how the VLIW code size can be reduced. How do we define VLIW? It's not so easy, but at least it should have multiple independent functional units that we also have in the superscalar processes, but here we have operations executed in parallel on these functional units are packed by the compiler into one VLIW, very long instruction word. So one instruction specifies a group of operations that are executed in parallel on these parallel functional units. These parallel operations within one instruction are often called slots or operation slots. When we cannot find an operation to fill these slots, we have to put a NOP, a NO operation, in the slot. Here's an example with five instruction slots. The first one is a load store operation. The second one must also be a load store operation. The third and the fourth one must be a floating point operation. And the last one, the last slot, can contain an integer or a branch operation. Here's an example pipelined VLIW processor. Let's assume that the five operations are not five times four, uh, meaning 20 bytes long, as in RISC uh, processor, but usually VLIW instruction set architectures have some tricks to reduce the size a little bit. So I'm going to assume that the VLIW instruction is 15 bytes long. This is usually achieved by restrictions such as having only one or two operations with an immediate field, etc. The figure looks very similar except for the parallel functional units to our simple pipeline processor that we presented some weeks ago. We have a, a program counter to the current instruction. It is used to address the index of the instruction cache. It is incremented not by four, but uh, as in a normal 32-bit instruction set, but by 15, since we assume that one VLIW instruction is 15 bytes long. After the instruction is decoded, we have a stage where the register files are read. We can see already the register files require a lot of ports to provide parallel access, parallel read and parallel write access. Then we have the parallel operations and then we write back the results. That is the basic approach. What do we see when we compare it to the superscalar approach? First, we see that there is no dependency checking hardware because the dependency checking has been done by the compiler. The parallel operations are available and will be executed in parallel on the parallel functional units. Issuing operations to the functional units is easy, while in Tomasulu's approach, you have a complex routing network or reservation stations corresponding to functional units. And the operations are aligned with the functional units. The first two need to be mapped to the first two floating point units. The following two need to be mapped to the load store units and the last one needs to be mapped to the integer unit. Again, we see that there are many ports to the register file, but this is also the case for superscalar processes. Fe furthermore, fetching parallel operations is easy. Because the operations are consecutive, unlike they are in the superscalar approach, where we might have several branches and we need to branch, predict and align. This is a slide that tries to show the subtle difference between the VLIW approach and the superscalar approach. The difference is where you draw the border between what is performed in runtime and what is performed in compile time. In the superscalar approach, which is the approach on top, the compiler compiles to basic risk-like object code and then the hardware takes over and performs independence check plus scheduling. In the VLIW approach, 
the compiler uh, of course generates code but it also performs independence checking and scheduling that hardware does in the superscalar approach. This way you get wide object code which is executed on the same parallel functional units as in the superscalar approach. So the hardware logic for independence checking and scheduling is needed for a superscalar approach, but it's not needed for the VLIW approach. To make everything even a little clearer, let's look at a small code example. This is our VLIW format. Load store operation one, load store operation two, floating point operation one and two, and the integer and branch operation. This is our scalar code. Load into F0, add F2 to F0 and put the result in F4, add 8 to the lab, store the results from F4 to memory, add 8 to the loop pointer, and then we check whether the loop pointer is at the end. This is a very familiar example that we saw many times before. This here shows the instruction latencies between the instructions. If the producing instruction is a floating point ALU and the consuming instruction is also a floating point ALU, the latency is, as you can see, three clock cycle. When it's a floating point ALU and the consuming instruction is a store instruction, the latency is two, etc. Now the goal is to unroll the scalar code loop as many times as necessary to eliminate any stalls. A stall in this case means that the issue cycle is completely empty. This is the solution to this exercise. We need to unroll the loop seven times to avoid completely empty issue cycles. At the top right you again see the table of latencies. We load the first element to F2 and then we have to wait one clock cycle before we can uh, perform the corresponding add. Similarly, after the add, we have to wait two clock cycles before we can perform the corresponding store. Once we produce the results, we need to store them back to memory. There's a two clock cycle latency between the AUU and the store operation, so we have to wait for two clock cycles and do all the stores then. Then the branch instruction is put in the slot of the ninth clock cycle. Because the integer to branch latency is one clock cycle, two. Therefore, we need to unroll seven times to avoid any st stalls. Stalls. That means we produce seven results in nine clock cycles. So we need 1.3 clock cycle per element. And on average, we achieve an efficiency of 50%. Let us compare once more the VLIW approach to the superscalar approach. In principle, VLIW hardware is simple. It requires less hardware and the power consumption is also reduced. Because we don't need all these overheads for, like for example, dependency check. However, the binary, the binary for VLIW processor is no longer binary compatible. Because when the number of VLIW slots or the number of parallel functional units or even when the latency between operation changes in another VLIW processor, the code is no longer working. And this is a huge issue. Because as a computer customer, at least in the general purpose domain, you don't buy source code, but you buy binaries, you buy executables. And if you do a hardware upgrade, and your binary doesn't work anymore, this is what you don't want. In addition, you need extremely good compiler support. But for embedded processes, embedded processes typically execute one or a few applications. And because of this, uh, uh, the compatibility barriers are much lower. Finally, the challenges for the VLIW approach. First, scheduling for a non-unit assumed latency called neural, which will be presented soon. Second, the code size explodes when you are not careful. And we need a many-ported register file 
and, and complex uh, forwarding logic. And we again have these malicious branches and the problem of lockstep operation. That means that one, one operation in the VLRW stalls, all operation have to stall. Finally, a small exercise. What will be the efficiency of the VLIW code example if the loop is unrolled eight times? Can we achieve 100% efficiency? If so, explain. If not, explain why not. This completes this lesson. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, I will discuss two other challenges of VLIW processes, namely the complexity of the register file and how to deal with control hazards. Hope to see you back.